honored and humbled to have a collection of the world's foremost experts in the various fields on this panel. Uh, I'm also honored to call them all friends. We have all been doing this together for a long time, some longer than others. Um, we've been on the same side, we've been on opposite sides, uh, but it's always been a pleasure. And we're very happy to welcome to this side uh, Judge Chapman, who is now in private practice. And I'm going to run through. This is terrible. I'm going to let everybody uh, introduce themselves, although everybody here does not need an introduction, but Josh Lusberg from Kirkland Elves. I'm Kelly Chavin, recently retired from the Southern District of New York Bankruptcy Bench, now uh, Senior Counsel at Wolfie Farm Gallagher. Steve Zell, <laughs> Bill Darrow from Mollis. Why uh, take a sip down? Why take a sip down? <laughs> uh, Brian Herman from Paul Weiss. David Kurtz Lazar. Tom Lario, White and Case. And Steve Zell from PJT Park. So uh, I think that this panel and group could probably talk for the next eight hours about the economy uh, and the state of the marketplace. We're going to try to congest that into the limited amount of time we have, 50 minutes. Uh, but we do want to cover, and I think we've heard, I, I say some comments at the outset, and you heard from Steve, just the general state of the economy writ large, what we're experiencing, you know, whether we are in a recession or about to be in a recession, as well as all the inflationary pressures. You know, I'm interested, maybe Bill, David, Steve, if you guys want to start, just give us your view of where we are in the market cycle from an economic standpoint. You said it, Bill. Oh, David, Steve. Uh, so, first of all, I thought that uh, Steve Gitball, I, I see Steve, uh, great presentation. Um, does anyone remember the name of the Federal Reserve Chairman before Paul Volk? No. Oh, okay. That's very good. Old. Uh, <laughs> most people don't. Uh, and right before them was uh, Burns. Most people don't remember either one of those two names because they were failures. Um, I don't think that Jerome Powell wants to be the one, one of those sort of remembered for being a failure or not remembered at all. Those of us who are old enough to remember high inflation, high interest rates, uh, it is a perniciously difficult thing to get rid of. Um, uh, and I think we're going to be in a very high interest rate environment for a while, uh, which is going to lead to a lot of defaults. I agree. I would say we're probably, feels like we're midway through the first quarter. Things are still ramping up. Activity is increasing. Sectors that were in great shape a year ago, retail, for example. Uh, I think many retailers are headed into a very precarious uh, holiday season, and uh, I think it's, it's going to be a busy time for restructuring. The only thing I'd add is that you know, people refer to high interest rates, and it's all relative to what happened for the last you know, five to ten years. At some level, we're kind of getting back to a level of normal, and the economy, which has been fueled heavily by we all know the reasons, is now probably setting back into some kind of structural normality, maybe accelerated by the pandemic and technology changing the way people behave more permanently, accelerating retail trends uh, to kind of online away from physical. So I have kind of a view that we are headed into kind of a near term kind of cycle that's going to be good for all of us on the table with some great investment opportunity. But from the long term, I don't know that we're ever going to see those kind of rates again. But what's happening now to be needed to happen is going to be painful for a while, but hopefully some long-term kind of benefit to the economy. Yeah, so um, one of the comments I made before some of you guys got here was when I started my career 20 years ago, I was a bankruptcy lawyer. And then 10 years in, we were restructuring lawyers. And now I'm a liability management lawyer, just because it's more palpable for the clients. They don't want to hear the word bankruptcy. And restructuring is a problem too. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion about liability management versus traditional restructurings. And extending runway, capturing discount, uh, maintaining and gaining liquidity. And I'm interested, Tom, Brian, Judge Chapman, you know, from a legal perspective, and Tom, it's interesting because you're typically on both sides of these. Uh, Brian, sometimes on both sides of these. Interested in your view as to what we're going to see over the course of the next year or so as far as these types of transactions? I'll uh, jump in. 
you know, uh, following up on the, the comments of the uh, esteemed uh, bankers here, I'm just a lawyer. Uh, what, what we're seeing a lot of is very, very bloated uh, balance sheets. Uh, and companies that are looking at not just uh, refinancing requirements in 23, but 24, 25, 26, and realizing that uh, they've got a balance sheet that's not refinanceable. So the question is, what can you do between here and there to try to put the company in a better position? So that the, the trauma that may in some cases be inevitable is, is uh, manageable uh, as opposed to uh, really destructive of value. Uh, so, you know, you see uh, exchange offers uh, being teed up where you've got debt that's got a four or five percent coupon that's trading, uh, you know, more like a 10 percent yield uh, down in the you know, 60s and 70s, uh, some cases even below that. Uh, and companies are trying to figure out how to capitalize on that. You've got a lot of Swiss cheese indentures uh, that permit uh, up tier uh, refinancings, uh, drop downs, uh, creation of unrestricted subsidiaries that can go out and uh, raise secured debt or issue secured debt in exchange for unsecured debt uh, at a discount. Uh, we're seeing a ton of that uh, in the market right now and a, a, a lot of companies that are trying to figure out how to capitalize on that in the hope that maybe they can somehow work around these uh, maturity walls that are out in the future. But I think at the end of the day, to put the company in a better spot uh, when that happens. Uh, and, you know, I would just say that, that from my perspective, um, you know, going from bankruptcy restructuring to liability management, the thing that I think we're all trying to do is figure out how to uh, not just be about value transfer, but to be a little bit more about value creation, which is uh, just hard to do. You're going to say Hertz now, right? A lot of value creation. Thank, thank you for taking care of me. Yeah, I think that. I think that last point is a really good one because um, I think on balance, the uh, movement towards liability management is positive because anytime you can fix a company's balance sheet out of court, it's a much better uh, way to go than a bankruptcy process, which tends to be very expensive and there's a degree of uncertainty associated with it. So it's much better to try to control your own destiny out of court. But I would say that the one thing that is a very big negative about the way practice has evolved is the value transfer uh, component of the equation or what people call creditor on creditor violence where um, the majority creditors are trying to disadvantage the minority creditors through these uh, up tiering and drop down type of transactions which lead inevitably to litigation out of court and then if there's a subsequent bankruptcy it gets very complicated as to who's entitled to what so it ends up actually overcomplicating the situation as opposed to solving the company's balance sheet problem. And many of these, I mean, I'd be curious uh, after Judge Chapman speaks to what the bankers think, but many of these end up resulting in added complexity and really don't address the problem. But I would be curious to your points of view on that. So I had a perfect setup for explaining why I left the bench because there's <laughs> definitely a trend away from bankruptcy cases, which we began to see, uh, I think, before the pandemic started, but certainly accelerated during, during the pandemic. So um, from a personal perspective, uh, that does explain a little bit of uh, why I'm on back, in, back in the private sector. But I do, do have a concern that bankruptcy not become obsolete. I do think that there's a place, particularly watching all the creditor versus creditor, litigation. Um, I think there is a place for the courts. Unfortunately, the expenses uh, have gotten very, very high, and it's very difficult to control that train, you know, once, once it gets rolling. Yeah, Brian, you know, your point's the right one, and I commented on it earlier. Whenever you're looking at a liability management transaction, it's always critical that you sit there in conversations with the board and say, to what end? Because you're right, when you're dropping down assets or exchanging multiple tiers of debt, you're creating a more difficult capital structure. And if you're unable to successfully create the runway to turn a business around, you're in a much worse place two, three, four years down the road. And the reality is, if you look at, Steve and I talked about this, Steve will weigh in. If you look at the liability management transactions that occurred over the course of the last 36 months, it's a small percentage of companies that actually ended up getting out of harm's way. And what ends up happening with the other ones is, 
a Frankenstein capital structure that leads to a more complicated, messy, and more expensive bankruptcy. Look, I mean, I would say, I've never been a board of directors or managers says I can't wait to be in bankruptcy. So they're always going to lean towards the alternative pathway. And I think, I mean, if you go back, by the way, exchange arms has been happening since God created high bonds, or Mike Milton. Yes. Uh, great high bonds. Um, they had to find a way to fix them. So it's, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, just the techniques have gotten more and more created. Uh, but I think the most recent some of those most recent ones, Josh, are like an analog to rescue financing of the, you know, pre-financial crisis, post-financial crisis. You see holes in indenture to put capital on the balance sheet to get the can down the road, and now you're using similar techniques <coughs> to kick the can down the road. The only thing I would say is that, you know, they, they get <coughs> a, a level of kind of conversation in the marketplace that why is anybody doing all this? And I think the way we think about it, having been on both sides of them, both trying to stop them and, and trying to pursue and complete them, is that you know fiduciary duties exist up and down the cap structure. If there are, if there is flexibility in dentures, and you're a private equity sponsor or a public company with billions of dollars of, inde of invested capital in business, and that asset exists, and you don't try to take advantage of it, you have to respond to your own investors saying, wait a minute, there was an opportunity to create option value which is real, why would I just give that up unless it was clearly certain that what caused the business to fail was never going to unwind? I mean, I wouldn't sell my house below its mortgage level if I thought the market was going to come back and just turn the keys over to the bank. So while there is criticism, um, I think it's justifiable that people look, people bought the indentures, bought the debt, knowing full well that that opportunity existed. And I think the only, I think, warning of all this is that, you know, it's something that is in the forefront of every practitioner about what the options are and for lenders, what you should be afraid of and therefore what you should do to protect yourself. Uh, but I, I, the, the idea that this is not necessarily the right thing for people, for companies to pursue, I think is ignoring the, the responsibilities they have to their own and private equity sponsor of a $3 billion equity check into a large company it's perfectly fair for that sponsor to think about what its opportunities are. I think the only point is the smaller investors who are not in the room tend to suffer more than the larger investors who are in the room. And that probably goes to how you should think about or how the market should think about making investments. Riding alongside a larger player doesn't mean you'll be in the room when something is pursued. Hey, Steve, how does the market think about the litigation uncertainty? Because there certainly have been a number of instances of what I would characterize as black swan events. Judges get it right, judges get it wrong. Um, you mean in bankruptcy or pre no pre-bankruptcy? Pre-bankruptcy. So you have obviously the Born Writers decision, and you have a few others that are all I think surviving. I could have this wrong. The motion to dismiss phase, right? Where some of those provisions, whether it's the open market purchase provisions, whether it's the sacred right provisions vis-a-vis -vis waterfalls, can be modified. That is all yet to unfold. It hasn't stopped transactions from being pursued and closing. The aftermath, for example, a deal called Mitel closed right after the board writer's decision, but like you still went through with it. Until someone says you can't, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't, and I can't even figure out what that means from a damage perspective with two years or three years later post-closing the lawyers in the house help me out. Well, by the way, the point, the, implications of that? the point in most of those transactions is to get an infusion of liquidity. And so you're doing it eyes wide open that there is litigation. The litigation's not all that relevant because you solved your acute liquidity problem. And that's the case in each of the examples that you cited. And then Judge Goldblatt's got a decision in TPC where there was creditor on creditor violence, and he came out suggesting that that was okay. I think it's different <clears throat> if there's new money versus just rolling out the existing debt, right? Because if it's new money, then sure, I guess you can help. Or disguise new money. Yeah, or disguise new money. New money that doesn't need it. It's just a roll up. Exactly. Right, exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. If it's new money, I think it's harder to challenge. If it's just rolling up debt and reordering people into capital structure, taking advantage of these waterfall provisions and credit agreements, I think that's a much dicier proposition from a legal challenge perspective. So let me ask a question, does that include extended runways that have fallen new money, given the maturity coming up, 
and then you get to make sure you point extended. Yeah, I think is that a form of new money? That's very so. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say that. So, so can I? That's right. So Steve said something, and uh, I know that Steve's not a lawyer. David used to be a lawyer. But, you know, gave it up a long time ago. Long time. I'm definitely not a lawyer anymore. Can I ask some lawyers? Um, when Steve said in the border, they've survived a motion to dismiss. I've heard some people that um, suggest that that's a really important thing that they survive a motion to dismiss. I've heard other people say like, okay, uh, you know, big deal. So can the lawyers maybe start to chat and explain to us why that's important or not important? Surviving a motion to dismiss is you've got game and it's not going to end. But so that motion to dismiss was by the company. company. Sale, you're going to assert a colorable claim. Right. right. So the judge is saying there's a colorable claim. So you've got game, you've got leverage, creates an opportunity either to settle or you're going to litigate over a period of time and ultimately settle favorably. But that's a huge thumb on the scale. So understandably a key point in the litigation. I think there's another dynamic too, which is hey, the financial benefits of being on the inside of 51% you know, majority that benefits from the creditor and creditor balance is so great that we'll just settle. So, you know, we'll get $100 of benefit and all right, so we'll give them, you know, we'll give them $20 back. We're still $80 ahead. And, and I know that that's the way some people think about these things, is let's just do it. In fact, someone gave me an analogy, which I think is a good one, which is you, you steal my car out of my garage. And I say, that's my car. And they say, well, that used to be your car. So I say, well, I'm going to file a lawsuit to recover the car. I say, all right, let's talk. What about I let you have the car one weekend every month? You can drive it from Friday to Sunday. Uh, and more times than not, there's a deal. And I think that is the mentality. So we're not going to get to keep it all. We have to get some back. I, I wanted to make one other comment about the liability management dynamic with companies because you know, I'm pretty sure I've been doing this longer than anyone else in this panel, maybe almost anyone else in this room. And if you ask me, what, what's the one thing that's changed the most in terms of what someone who does what we do for a living um, has to be good at it in order to get hired. Uh, there almost is some exceptions, you know, something erupts, and Chapter 11 case has to be filed in a week. But almost all of our Chapter 11 business over the last several years started out as a liability management assignment. And that's what companies are looking for is, you know, we don't, we're hiring you to keep us out of bankruptcy, not to tell us how to get in bankruptcy. Yes, maybe it won't work, but hope springs eternal. We're hiring a new CEO. We've got a new business plan. Things are going to turn. There's always a reason to believe that the sun is going to come out tomorrow. And so it, with, without the liability management capability and credentials, just the knowledge around the science behind you know, how you pull these things off, uh, I think, especially on the company side, it's very difficult to be successful. It's a completely different conversation. And I think that's why every one of us said, you know, changed our names from, you know, bankruptcy and then it was restructuring and now it's, you know, liability management and capital solutions or whatever. Uh, we're really marketing a, a very different product. It's a contiguous product, but it's a different product. And, you know, that's the name of the game. Uh, as as we see it, and I think that's just a huge fundamental change from the way we see it. Yeah. I was going to say just two things. One, <clears throat> in terms of the um, significance of the motions to dismiss, I do think they're significant um, for the reason Judge Chapman said. But to Steve's point about people are still doing the transactions, keep in mind if you're not in bankruptcy where you can get quick decisions from good judges. Um, you're in state court or federal district court where you're not going to get quick decisions. And so a lot of this litigation will play out over a much longer period of time. And then you would need to get to an appellate level, maybe multiple appellate levels, before you actually got a binding determination that you can can't do these kinds of transactions. And so I think we're a long ways away from 
And you have to pay the own, your, and you, your own costs. And you have to pay the costs. So you're a long you way away. You're paying well before all Yeah, so we're a long right. way away from getting a judicial determination that is going to, I think, materially alter the market in these transactions. So these didn't hear <laughs> um, The second thing, to David's point, not only do companies not want to file for bankruptcy, but the lenders don't want to file for bankruptcy either. The prevalence of CLOs in these capital structures and their uh, disinclination to take equity unlike the distressed uh, funds who are looking to uh, buy distressed debt and take equity, has significantly altered uh, the landscape because you have now the company doesn't want to file, the lenders don't want the company to file, so that leads to a lot of these liability management transactions. So the one, one thing that apropos of what's going on now with FTX, where it's been widely reported that SBF said, you know, if I Eight minutes later, I was going to get all the money I needed to save, right. save this thing. Eight minutes later, eight million dollars, whatever. But from the perspective, and this was mentioned in the opening talk about Lehman Brothers, which I um, handled for a number of years, there's bad disruption at the moment of filing bankruptcy. I still maintain um, that Lehman was solvent. The recovery levels that you heard are, in fact, true. Over heading towards 50 cents on the dollar. There was actually, other than the lack of political will, I don't believe a reason for Lehman to file the value destruction that was created was uh, was extreme. So I think in the more ordinary company, there's going to be, in most cases, a lot of value destruction at the moment of bankruptcy, and that's yet another reason to continue to try to manage it at the board. You know, I think there's a, a bit of a, 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 a paradox around filing or not filing. Um, you know, the, we forget that the bankruptcy code has a lot of tools to help a company increase its value, to shed uh, bad assets, to reposition its its uh, business in a place where it were actually improved. In the old days, when, when I was first in this business, companies filed bankruptcy, they worked hard to come up with a new business plan and fix <coughs> the business, and then negotiate a plan on top of that business plan. Um, the, you know, when you talk about value destruction upon the filing of bankruptcy, I think that's a little bit wrong. I think that bankruptcy I've been cases. waiting years to say publicly <laughs> that I'm wrong. <laughs> I knew it was only a matter of moments. <laughs> I can't believe it took 30 minutes. That, 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 the next panel, by the way, about the history of bankruptcy. Yeah. So, so the, the thing about it is, is a bankruptcy case that's a pre-negotiated or pre-packaged bankruptcy case, I think is destructive of value because it forces recognition of value at the worst possible moment. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what everybody wants to do. It's the easy solution from the company's perspective. It often includes a clear reward to management because they get re-upped on their uh, compensation package. And you have the senior lenders who have the most strength saying, hey, we'll make a deal with you. We'll equitize. All you got to do is wipe out everybody behind us. And so that becomes some sort of pre-negotiated, pre-packaged plan that totally ignores all the value creation opportunities that the bankruptcy code provides and just sets up the bankruptcy case as a, a fight between the senior lenders and the junior lenders over who's going to get the value and who's going to get left out. And I, and I can assure you that any senior lender who buys their debt for 50 cents with the intention of owning it doesn't think that the company is worth 50 cents. They think it's worth more. What they want to do is drive the improved business plan after they've cut off the rest of the capital structure. And I, I think that's the thing that we've got to really think about a lot when it comes to, you know, again, bankruptcy cases have, have drifted towards the pre-packed, the pre-negotiated, in, out, it's quick, it's cheap. Uh, you know, we don't have all the fees and all that. But the cost of doing that, the cost of doing that is maybe the elimination of hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of value that would otherwise be available to junior stakeholders if you took a little time to try to fix the business before you reset the balance sheet. That's the only thing I'd say to that is one I agree with. But Ooh, really? <laughs> two, two firsts. But, one. but there are two things, there are two things to, to focus on. One is balance sheets today versus 20, 30 years ago are all secure versus unsecure. And there are plenty of folks who can talk about what rights a secure creditor has versus an unsecure creditor. And two, if that value creation was there, 
And there was a reason to stay in chapter longer. We always say, I'm sure David has said this, I know Bill has said this, because he said it to me, if you believe that there's that kind of value, just fund us junior to all the debt in front of you. And that never tends to happen. And the focus then tends to be on litigation to create value by junior stakeholders in a senior kind of a senior finance guy. Yes, I think. I think I think there's a lot of stuff Well, I'm sure David has said that to me also over the years. I still think that. It's the great <laughs> look. It's the golden rule. You know, he who has the gold makes the rules. Yeah. The problem is that it's so hard, and, and companies are, I don't know, I, I can't think of, of any that um, where you have an opportunity to borrow money on a consensual basis from you know, the existing senior secured lenders, and the alternative is a uh, adequate protection fight. There's money available, but you have to prevail in the adequate protection fight, cash collateral. What company decides to take on that fight? That's a very, very start the case, going to war. Talk about value. It's, yeah. it's not just about having a fight, though. It's if you can set up a, a scenario where the senior lenders think that you might have a fight. Well, in your case, people will believe that. But <laughs> no, you say that as a, that's a compliment. But they don't believe it. Ah, yeah, right. You're going to, you know, day one of the case, you're going to tell the world you don't have any money, adequate protection, battle. You're never going to win. What? It's it's a very difficult proposition for a board to make that decision. But I think the biggest, it's all about the capital structure and how much cash the company has. So if the company files and gone on fumes and filed with, We'll say five million dollars cash on hand, or maybe less. <laughs> uh, then you have no choice but to, to go with your your first lien-ish lenders because they're the ones who are there. You don't really want to put up that fight. But the other hand, you file with a billion dollars, a billion half dollars in cash. Then you've well, got a lot more cash collateral. Well, it's our cash. Yeah, but you have a, same you know, But you have a better. You're not. You're kind of. It was able to ask for forgiveness as opposed to you already have the money. So then you're fighting over what the rules are about having it as opposed to trying to get the money up front where you're a lot more desperate, right? You're asking to give you the money to say, oh, I'm going to give it to you unless under these uh, terms versus I have the money, you know, the judge is going to let you use the cash in the beginning, kind of no matter what, uh, you know, for some period of time until you get to some cash collateral agreement. You have a bit more, I think you have a lot more leverage as the debtor in that dynamic than when you are out of cash and you have to ask for the money to get into bankers. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally. And then, sorry, then, Steve, there's a lot of capital starts with today. That's not going to make huge first earlier. Sorry? That's no. not going to No, they're not going to make They play out right. Yeah. They still play the string out and then file at the end when they've got, when, when they have less cash. Right. Yeah, right. You should burn the furniture. A little inside baseball. We kept on waiting for Josh to send us questions from his panel, and he refused to do so. And he said he's just going to say hello and then see what happens. <laughs> it's happened. It worked out well. It's happened. <laughs> so, on that topic, uh, one of the things we wanted to cover to give the audience kind of a, a flavor for what's to come is you know sector specific action. And David, you mentioned you know retail is going to experience a pain. I mentioned earlier real estate is going to experience a pain. And you know over the course of the last two years. It's really been episodic. Uh, there hasn't been one particular area of bass interest. We did oil and gas for a while. There was retail for a while. And again, it's been episodic. But I think now you're seeing, in light of the distress, inflation, uh, increase in rates, right, there are various sectors that are getting dealt with. And there are also some specific types of companies that are utilizing Chapter 11. And I wanted to start with Judge Chapman, and I don't want you to talk about Purdue. But you did mediate Purdue, and we're seeing a lot of companies utilize Chapter 11, frankly, in my humble opinion, the way it's supposed to be used, to deal with mass board liabilities, whether it's 3M, Johnson & Johnson. Do you think this is something that we're going to see a lot more of? I do. I, I think you know, there's obviously a debate about whether or not this is a misuse of the bankruptcy process. I, under most circumstances, believe, and I'm not going to talk about Texas two-step, but uh, this is the highest and best use of the bankruptcy process. I mean, it was created here in the Southern District of New York uh, as a tool to manage massive asbestos liabilities. Um, I can tell you firsthand from, from Purdue, uh, it was definitely the only forum in which the real victims of the opioid crisis uh, were going to receive help uh, in, in real time. 
litigation would have extended forever. Of course, the case is still up on appeal of the Second Circuit. What happens remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, there are many, many folks in our field who have become very uh, expert in the mass tort field. Uh, and I think that they are uh, talking about creating value. I think they are creating value. Uh, for people who otherwise would be left uh, with no recourse for a very, very long time. Obviously, it's a, a very hot topic uh, as to whether and when it's okay to separate the good from the bad. I'll leave that for someone else to talk about. Others chime in on mass tort sectors. Where are you seeing activity? I, I, we're, we're seeing it across the board. I mean, the fact is that companies were able to borrow a ton of money uh, at very low prices. Capital was just flowing into the market and that access has been cut off. Uh, you know, it's not just that the cost of refinancing has gone up, the cost of refinancing is unavailable to, to a lot of these companies. And I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, industry focused. I think the money flowed every, everywhere the money went, that's where you're going to see restructurings because these companies are over levered. They have debt they can't pay, they can't grow, they can't maintain themselves. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars annually on interest service, uh, debt service, and it's it's unsustainable. So I, I think it's it's you're going to see it uh, across the board. I don't want to say it's a recession. I just think you've you've had a, a period of time where so much money has been available on such good terms that you're going to see a me of necessity that debt is going to have to be, and you know the people who like this and other people who hate it effectively converted back in that, which is what a lot of it you know, really is at this point in disguise. Now, I heard, so Steve said something about a lot of secured debt. So just to level set people, the kinds of capital structure we're talking about, they're like five to six times levered at the first lien level out of the box, typically with, with uh, loans. That's all floating rate, which set a floating rate, which had a really good rate, really low. So I heard a statistic the other day. I, I didn't get the number exactly right, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> for a banker. For a banker. Right. So the leverage loan market's like what a trillion four or something like that, and single B uh, component of that's like three hundred and fifty billion dollars. So someone told me that the aggregate free cash flow of all of the issues in the single B cohort three notes. I bet you what this down. Um, I said it's in the three million it's either three million dollars or three billion dollars. I say it doesn't really matter. That's three billion dollars. That's less than one percent of the debt that's free cash flow for these companies. So you say, well, how do they finance themselves? Because they all have gotten revolvers in place, and so they basically finance their losses with revolvers. And then money's to 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 Tom's point, it's been so cheap and easy that they just get sold three years later at a higher multiple, a higher price. And so it's sort of like musical chairs, but no one's ever really stopped to figure out that these companies are cash flowing their capital structures. So it doesn't take, I can't remember what Gitmo said about uh, uh, where he thought rates were going, but I think it's something like a 5% Fed fund race, a third to 45, I can't remember the, say a third to a half of the single B, lower single B tranches will be uh, less of one times coverage, which unless you've got a big revolver you can use for a very long time, you get one. Yeah, and that's across the board, no industry specific. And I think, Bill, that, that's really an important point, which it goes to the point that low interest rates for a long time had markets chasing yield, and when you chase yield with the single B, double B, triple C markets. Uh, you know, but when, when you talk about one, you have low interest rates, huge availability of capital, and no one has ever experienced it, at least I have, maybe others have, but a complete shutdown of the global economy and then starting that economy back up again and could predict with any certainty what that was going to mean. And most of the capital that flowed into the system, built to your point, in the last couple of years, all came back saying, we're just gonna get back to 2019. We're just gonna finance you because we're gonna get as you if, back to 20, as if, I'm sorry, as if by 21 or 22, as if, oh, once we start everything back up, everything will be okay. And you're seeing you know, dislocation in human capital you're seeing dislocation in, in capital resources, and you're seeing an acceleration of the technological trend that we all saw coming, that staying at home for a year or two just made it much more prevalent in the near term. And industries have been turned upside down, the consumer has been turned upside down, 
And I think when you look at you know the next five or ten years, this goes back to the meaningful shift in what we're going to be in ten years. But you know, I always go back. Steve put up a chart that had you know what happened to Amazon, Netflix, and so on and so forth. I would go back to a chart that a business school professor put up back in the eighties, saying, "Look, look, look at the top thirty companies in the Dow." or the S&P 500, and then look 30 years from now and point out every one of those companies that are still in that down. And it's very, very different. I couldn't do it by heart. But I guarantee you, I believe, I can't guarantee that that pace of change, the top 30 today, will not be the top, top 30 in a shorter period of time than what happened five or 10 years ago. So I'm still used to being able to ask questions whenever I want. My question is my question is about real estate. Um, could could some of you talk about real estate? Uh, I've been reading reports that in real estate investors are stepping back. Um, see what's happening in Midtown, real estate offices are not building up again. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing maybe other folks would too, what you see, to your point, Steve, about how different things are going to look, what you're seeing both in residential and commercial real estate coming down the pipe. I, I can start with this very sector-focused you know, distribution. If you want to invest in real estate, investing in distribution is a great place to invest, right? That last mile get your you know, product into someone's hands in 24 hours. I think that's where you want to be. It's an easy place to look at it, to look at. Two, um, you actually are seeing repurposing the real estate in a way that you haven't seen. Before. Everyone talks about the definition of A mall, B mall, and a C mall. That definition is actually changing from my, A malls in the middle of towns will always do well, but how they present themselves is different. It's much more lifestyle than retail. But when you look at a sea mall that's in the middle of uh, 100 miles one from, the, from the center that you know the retailers are pulling out for obvious reasons, it's being replaced by residential and distribution. So the, the market, capital is pretty smart. They may make mistakes along the way, but they always find their way into the proper use. That doesn't mean there won't be winners or losers, and I can't sit here and predict what's going to happen long-term to the housing market, but I think long-term housing has tended to be a good investment, but for cyclical ups and downs. And the part that I will not speculate on is the, um, is the, is the commercial office space in major cities where you see vacancy and then coming back. All I know is that two years ago I was offered an opportunity to invest in commercial real estate in secondary cities that people were relocating to because they thought the pandemic shifts might create you know, an opportunity to work in Savannah, even though your company is based in, in New York. And then we woke up and invited everybody back to the office and said, you had to show up. And everybody had moved away and said, uh-oh, I need to get back. So I, I don't know how that's going to play out, so I wouldn't put my crystal ball on, that, on, the, on the office here. But just interest rate, like, you know, my first house I bought in Santa Monica in 1992 or three, and I think the mortgage was like, 8.65 and that was a bargain and you know for most of us prior to the last five-ish years or so or three whatever it was five percent was a really cheap mortgage and maybe you do a three and a half percent you know five-year fix and floating if you're really, really, really lucky but you know you're probably going to make it a little bit longer but you know I, I i got a construction loan for a house we built it was a, right before covid three percent and it flipped into three percent for 30 years that's giving you money, right? Giving money away, and you're not, you couldn't get that now for six percent. So that same house, if you were doing from an affordability perspective, how much you pay per month just can't be worth as much. Cars, same thing. People can't, you know. I, I heard the other day a car payment is up almost a hundred percent. The cost of a new car is something like forty nine thousand dollars average cost. So. You know, where's that? I mean, pe people have gotten, uh, uh, unfortunately, way too used to low interest rates. Exactly. It's going to be a for decades. Exactly. But, you know, the interest rates alone don't uh, create or, or destroy value. We just represented 245 Park Avenue, the Chapter 11 case. You know, beautiful address on Park Avenue. They're not making more of them. Uh, this thing had a billion seven of reinstatable debt, 
at a blended interest rate of about 4%. So as this thing was going through Chapter 11, we thought that might be our biggest asset. And the problem is there's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen with Midtown real estate that that wasn't enough to attract third-party money into the deal. So we ended up doing a deal with the existing cash flow structure. So it's, it's tricky. Okay. But being in Miami is probably a good place to be. If, if you already own <laughs> And I do. <laughs> um, you know, as far as real estate is concerned, just one other point, and I think Bill made this one, but if you're a new entrant into the market, looking for your first home, your first apartment, and you didn't get into the market in the last year, right? It's just a huge excessive cost of capital that's now out there for people. And I've heard a lot more people are now renting, waiting to see what happens with rates and waiting to see if Steve Gittlemall's right that the government wants to force a recession so that inflation goes down and the rates can go down again. Uh, and I think that as a result, over the course of the next 18 months, it's gonna be major pressure on a lot of different real estate companies, both residential and commercial. So I say this as the former treasurer of the Democratic Party. The government does not want to force a recession. The Federal Reserve does. That's very fair. Can't get to a seat soon. Can't get to a seat soon. Very fair. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, activity level is concerned, at a time you mentioned that you know you're seeing it from from all sorts of places. I'm wondering, you know, Steve, David, Bill, you know, you guys see a lot of different opportunities across all sorts of different sectors. Just generally speaking, you know, what's the, the sentiment amongst the firm as far as where everybody is spending time and what people should expect? I, I think it's uh, what Tom said. <laughs> Putting aside the crypto debacle, which is kind of a you know, situation in and of itself, this time it feels like uh, I think there's some industries that are more vulnerable than others, but it feels very much across the board that you know, companies are, in many different industries, are affected by supply chain issues. They're affected by inflation. They have floating rate debt that's increasing. And so I, you know, I was thinking about this walking over, just in my own mind, all right, the latest generation of new engagements you know, is there a preponderance that would be tied to one industry? And for us, it's not. It's pretty much across the board. And I'll just say, if you look at kind of where distress was back in 2015, those industries that were at the top of the chart have now fallen to the very bottom of the chart. Oil and, oil and gas in particular, retail, which is, which is big in name, but not a lot in terms of debt, although there are high profile things out there. But I think we, we, I do believe it's going to be, like David and Bill said, a kind of cross sector. We look today where we're seeing most of it, at least in its initial phases, is healthcare, tech, uh, media, entertainment, and then some kind of consumer focused businesses. But as I believe is the case with SAR down in the auto industry um, and housing being impacted by, which has such an ancillary impact on the economy, of course. People don't go to the movies, that's where they impact the economy. People don't buy a car, buy a house, products. building products. That, that has a broad base, and I think that anything where the consumer is going to get pinched at the bottom end, it's always, a, it's always about the, the consumer in my mind. I think you're going to see it starting to spill much, as David and Bill predict, spill, it's spilling much more broadly than we have seen. Yeah, building products is interesting because a lot of those deals got done during the pandemic, and they're relatively right. recent with a lot of debt. Uh, and no one expecting because there was such a demand during the course of the pandemic, and now it's muted. Uh, so it's a very interesting. I think I saw last week that the price of wood has gone down 75%. Why was it? And, and all I know is that for people who may, may be redoing their house, if you wanted to redo your house, you have to put it up for glass, for windows. It's like a 12 to 15 month lead time. Yes, I have a personal experience. So just that whole sector is turned upside down by the supply chain, and that's not going away unless somehow China goes from zero COVID to COVID doesn't exist policy. Uh, that's not going away for a long time. Well, the other interesting thing I read this morning, so consumer spending over the course of this weekend, right, big shopping week, was up 12%. But what the reports don't indicate is that the margins, my buddy in the audience told me this today, were down almost an equivalent amount. Yeah. And so people are out spending, but they're buying products that are reduced 
and it's creating inventory problems, I'm sure. And it's just the supply chain vicious cycle over and over again. Um, so all of that ends up creating uh, an incredibly exciting market environment. And as I said this morning, I think there's no better time to be a liability management restructuring <laughs> bankruptcy professional. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and solution. We'll, we'll provide them all together. And um, anyone has any parting comments, by all means, I did want to say I'm honored again to have this great group of people uh, who I all consider a friend on the panel today. I think it was a great discussion. Um, I think, again, right, this economy is in a challenging moment in time, much different than where we sat last year at this time. Uh, and not that wood, and I hope it's okay for all the companies, but good for all of us as well. So thank you for, for all being here. Deferred all you guys and any other comments? Next year we'll be in the room and we'll be we'll talking be about how this year is completely different from last <laughs> year. The only question. thing is we don't know how. Question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in, the, in the instances where you all are seeing uh, bank debt, are you seeing bank behavior change in the restructuring or the pre-restructuring? phase because the difference in regulation, the decline in bond prices, the withdrawal of deposits, and then the regulation. Are you all seeing bank behavior change? I mean, actual bank debt, not, yes. not terminal fees. Right, and the, you know, the bank fees. Real estate, real estate, yeah. deals. Yeah. in real estate, the bank margins, I think, are so low that they, they become, I think, notoriously, I mean, for, for all the right reasons, my experience, and, and it's been real estate focused, where you see a lot of bank leaving the law versus signing oil and gas. It has been historically a complicated discussion with banks who are under increasing pressure to get out. If they don't see a broader relationship with a company that brings underwriting, and brings M&A, brings other kind of cash management services, it's not an account that they're going to focus on long term. So big names, they'll be there for you, but in, in the world that we deal with, once that becomes kind of a, a name that nobody wants to kind of have as a client, they become very complicated for all of the reasons. They, they deserve their money back and they do what they can to get it back. The banks are in better shape now than they've ever been. Their capital ratios and things like that. It's much, much smarter. They went through all kinds of stress tests that I'm not a big bank for there, so they didn't know about big bankers. They're, they've never really been helping with big banks. So, but I agree, see, the, their reaction then is uh, interestingly kind of uh, counterintuitive. Uh, the minute there's there's uh, a problem, uh, they're tightening up, they're reducing uh, the exposure. I mean, that's like that, that's when we need to make them understand that there is no getting out. Like all, all of you can't get out because there's no one that's ready to get in to take your place. So uh, that's just not going to happen. So now let's talk about where we go from there. There was a word I wanted to pick up on. You mentioned regulation. I think regulation is something that people ought to keep an eye on for uh, uh, restructuring opportunities because by definition, regulation tends to uh, interfere with the free market uh, function. And so you end up having capital flowing into businesses because of regulation that, that may not really have a market, uh, that people hope they have a market, and I think those businesses you know, are, are something to keep an eye on. And it's, it's kind of on both sides of the coin because then regulation also causes capital not to flow into certain businesses that do have a market and they become unfinanceable. You know, the, the fossil fuel uh, companies right now, we've been through a number of situations where the value of a power plant clearly would support the debt, but the company could not refinance because there was nobody willing to step in and provide the ESG, exactly. right? Exactly, huge problem. I, I think I think you're going to see a lot of impact of, of ESG uh, in our business on, on both sides. You're going to see companies that have been created through regulation that, at the end of the day, are not yet good businesses, and you're going to see companies that are being impaired by that same regulation that, that fundamentally are good businesses but can't attract capital. So keep an eye out in that space. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much.